Shane Malloy is with us here on uh, Winnipeg Sports Talk. Now, as you predicted to me off the air heading into round one, the Winnipeg Jets were going to have some choices of some pretty good players at 18. They end up going with Colby Barlow. And I can tell you, having interviewed him right after he was picked, he uh, he hit a home run in the interview portion when it came to, um, you know, the Win- the message to Winnipeg Jet fans. Um, and, you know, you look at his numbers. I mean, the guy can score. He had, what, 46 goals in 53 games, I believe, last year. Um, but you've spent a lot of time watching this player, comparing him to others. What is Winnipeg getting in Colby Barlow? You're getting a character. You're getting a potential captain. You're getting a guy who's going to drag you into the fight, whether you want to or not. And you actually will want to because he's so engaging and charismatic as a person. And I'm sure, you know, the Winnipeg fans got that. We got that when we interviewed him uh, as he came off the stage when we were on Sirius XM, NHL Network Radio. You know, and the other thing about Colby is, is he's a guy who's going to play in the greasy areas. He's going to go to the net. He's going to win battles. He's going to wear down defensemen. He's got a great shot. He's going to score greasy goals. He's going to score playoff goals. And he, it was actually interesting. I asked him a question about Rutger McGordy, uh, Winnipeg's last year pick. And he goes, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with his game. I know his game. And I go, he goes, we're going to be great together. It's going to be so much fun. He goes, I can't wait to play with him. He goes, we're going to just, we're going to be a duo that's going to cause a lot of people havoc. Like he just intentionally wants to be a havoc creator in that respect. And what he's going to do is be able to create time and space for those skilled forwards around him. The Ehlers of the world, the Profetis of the world, when defenders have to draw to him, because they have to, because if you don't, he's going to score on you in tight. I really like the pick because it's a, it's a character pick for Winnipeg. And he's a guy who's going to wave the banner of Winnipeg. He's going to be proud to be there. He wants to be there. A lot of guys will say, yeah, I'm happy to be there, but you can see it in his face. Like you can't disguise, you know, when the eyes dilate and, you know, he has the, his body language, it just screamed. I can't wait to go to Winnipeg. Cause it's, he's a bit of a, he's got some piss and vinegar in him and he likes to say up yours. Right. And that's like when you live in a smaller city comparative to the other NHL cities, Winnipeg has a little bit of that too. And that's great. I like that about Jets fans, right? So he fits the mold of the Winnipeg Jets, and I, I could see him be there for a long, long time. Well, it, it, it's funny you say that because, uh, I mean, I, I simply asked him what was it like to hear your, your name called by the Jets in the first round. And literally the first thing he said, Shane, was that, hey, I'm a Canadian kid. I am so pumped to be coming to a Canadian team. And as they say, I know these prospects are coached, and, you know, if the cynic in you can say, oh, well, anyone can say that. But it really did seem genuine. And, I mean, he said a similar thing to you right now. And and it's funny you mentioned Rucker McGrory because I finished the interview. I turned around to Jamie Thomas and Remus, and I'm like, that just feels like Rucker 2.0. Um, 100%. Uh, I mean, these and, and let's face it, we know that there's been plenty of discussion about what the Winnipeg Jets culture was the last few years. And obviously with the bio to Blake Wheeler looking to really sort of turn the page. Um, I know it's a lot to expect of, you know, players this young to sort of be culture carriers of a professional team. But I have to admit when these guys get to the national hockey league and are Winnipeg Jets, it can only be great for the atmosphere around that hockey club, both in the dressing room. And I'd say in the community with their fans as well. Well, they embrace it. It's part of their personality. They actually want to do it. It's not that, you know, they're asked to do it and they do it because they're obligated. They actually want to do it. It's important to them. It's part of their identity as people. And those are the kind of players that you need to have. If you look around Stanley Cup winners, you're always going to have a couple guys like that. You know, how much, and I'm not saying Colby Barlow is going to be offensive or Rodgers is going to be as offensively talented as the Tuchuk brothers, but those two players, the Chuck brothers bring an element to the franchise on and off the ice. That's infectious. That what you want to follow them into the, into the fray head first. You know, it, it helps other guys who are uncertain. This is why you want to be here. We're going to be the small market team that surprises everybody. And we're going to win. Cause I like as much as people say, Oh, Toronto will go bananas if they win the cup. Cause this hasn't happened since 67. I think Winnipeg's party will be better. And I would fly in on purpose just to hang out with you at that party. Cause that would be absolutely bananas. 
Uh, I, I love it. Um, you know, speaking of Rutger, um, because I think we'll always be connecting these two players and making their connections. I mean, Rutger and Lambert will all be always be connected because they were both first rounders in the same year. But the similarities of what Rutger McGrory and Colby Barlow bring to the uh, bring to the table, um, both on the ice and off the ice, seem to be quite uh, quite clear. Um, we had a great chat about Rutger in the pick last year, Shane. And you paid quite attention to the University of Michigan with Fantilli and the other prospects there. What can you tell us about his growth over the last 12 months and where Rucker McGrody is right now as he enters his first development camp here in the peg? Well, what I'm really intrigued by is just his, his work rate went higher and it was about his skating base. And if that could improve, he just needs to be average. He just needs to be an average skater. And I think, it, you know, if he's that at the NHL level, his his other abilities are going to make, make him a really tough player to play against. Because you can play with pace and speed by using the puck and using give and go. Look at Mark Stone. Is he a fast forward? No. Is Tyler Toffoli? No. But they understand how to skate the game effectively. And that's something we talked to Jimmy Roy about specifically is about helping them understand when to change their speeds, when to take certain angles. And where you want the where you want to go to where the puck is, and you know so they're both those players, particularly Rudker and and so is Colby. They like to play below the, the bottom of the dots in the greasy areas. Honestly, I think both of those guys are going to be the Bash brothers. They're the Bash brothers for Winnipeg Jets. Wait till they're like 22, 23. They're going to be an absolute menace. No one's going to want to play them. Nobody. And it's going to be fun to watch, and the fans are going to go bananas over them like there's gonna be posters and signs bash brothers because they're just gonna be chaos in front of that poor goalies poor defensemen i almost feel bad for them almost <laughs> uh i'm sure there's a lot of jet fans having a tough time containing their smiles right now listening to this um brad lambert had a really weird year um he played on you know a number of different leagues finished very strong with seattle uh winning a whl championship and going to the memorial cup um, he spent some time in the American League. He went to the World Juniors. Um, wh what did you make of his last season and his readiness to make the transition to the pro game full-time right now, Shane? I think it was really important for him to get a taste of the American League and understand what he needs to do. Like, what kind of, what kind of game do I play? How can I be successful at the pro level in, in North America? Because obviously the ice service dimensions, the style of game is a little bit different, obviously, from Finland. But what I liked is that he got to go play in Seattle and be the man, be one of the top players, and let's make a long run. I think it was really good for his confidence. Uh, of course, playing for your country is really important because that there's a, a pride element to that. Uh, and I think it was just like he needed some stability. You knew what he did. He's really needed some love from the Winnipeg Jets organization. And I think they gave that to him. When I had a conversation with Jimmy about that, he goes, no, he was just – he went through a lot of turmoil. There was a lot of, like – outside noise expectations of him that really, you know, weighed on him heavily. Right. And he admitted that. And, you know, I think Jimmy and, and the rest of the development staff really said, let's have a clean slate. What happened yesterday doesn't matter anymore because you can't do anything about it. So let's work on something positive and let's work on some stuff here and let's have a really good season. Let's get you a lot of different opportunities and build up your confidence and make you feel good about your game and about yourself. And let's head back into the off season, get a good training in, and then let's start fresh. And I think that was a really good mindset for, for Brad in that respect. Um, one of the other guys I wanted to ask you that I, I'll, I'll be honest, we were at development camp this morning and we were focusing more on the forwards because they split the forwards and the D on different pads. But I was telling the chat earlier and everyone with us that I um, hooked up with Jimmy Roy at a moose game and we were, talking about a whole bunch of stuff uh, in the second half of the season. And he could not stop raving. Uh, they were so excited about so many of the players from last year's draft. But Elias Salmonson, um, the Swedish defenseman, was a guy that, listen, I mean, honestly, we're not paying that much attention to what's happening in Sweden throughout the year. He was a little right. bit more off the radar. He talked about his development, how he played with men, and his readiness to become a player that could be a very good blue liner for a long, long time. What do you know about uh, Elias, even from his draft year and, and anything you can tell us on how he progressed over the last 12 months? Well, I think it was really important for him. You know, obviously he played, he split between um, J20 and the Swedish Elite League. 
J20 is, you know, he was too good for that league. It's a little bit more chaotic um, in that respect. And the Swedish Elite League is far more structured in that in that respect. And I think what he did was he settled his game down in terms of understanding. So when you have defensemen, you know, in the J20, they can get away with a lot of things when moving the puck. In the Swedish Elite League, you can't. And for him, it's really understanding the first option is generally 90% of the time your best option. So when you go and retrieve the puck, what's your first option? Move it cleanly and then move to a position where you can, you know, be an option for either the defenseman that you pass it to or one of the forwards. And I think that part of his game really cleaned up nicely is, you know, his puck retrieval. For me, for defensemen, retrieve pucks, you got to exit clean. It doesn't have to be sexy. It's got to be clean, right? Uh, because, you know, in the NHL, players are almost always where they're supposed to be. And when you start to recognize that, I thought that part of his game um, really got better. And I thought he did a better job of understanding how to use leverage in terms of defending down low, getting underneath armpits and leaning on hips and getting better body position and boxing guys out. I thought that improved this year as well. So once again, he's a young D-man. So I'd like to see him play. I think he turns 19 in August. So he's a late birthday. He's still a young kid. So I think he should play two more years in the Swedish Elite League and then come over and then into, cause I don't like seeing young defensemen being thrown to the walls of the American league. It's just too tough. Like it's just defense is the hardest position to learn in the American league. It's the hardest. Like those forwards are, you know, tenacious, fast skating, highly skilled. It's the second best league in the world. So give them a little bit more time, but you know, they got something there. And I understand why Jimmy's really excited about them. You know, I was basically going to ask you that, but I mean, how would you compare <laughs> the American hockey league to something like the, uh, the Swedish elite league. Um, and what would the different challenges be for, you know, a young, I mean, yeah, August 31st. I mean, he's basically when training camp opens, he's going to be having his 19th birthday when it comes to, and again, the goal of this is to prepare these young men to succeed when they get to the national hockey league. I mean, from your perspective, Shane, for a young Swede, um, you know, the differences between coming over here, learning the North American game, um, or really excelling at the, uh, you know, over in Europe? Well, the difference is, is just the angles obviously are different. The speed at the play, uh, more play at the net uh, from that standpoint. So that those are three big factors in terms of defensemen. So you have to understand how you take your angles. Your gap has to be a little bit different than the Swedish Elite League because you have more space wide. Um, there's less combativeness around the net in that respect because players have more time and space. So it's really about you got to redefine his habits because you have a little bit different habits when you play in the Swiss elite league than you would in the American league based on that. So it's one of the things that's like, it's not as bad as junior, right? Where junior hockey, most defensemen or forwards have some bad junior habits because they can get away with a lot and you can't get away with that at all in the American league. So from that respect, that's really to me, is that a really defining moment about how quickly he can adapt his habits to the American Hockey League um, as he once he comes over from the Swedish Elite League? And I think he should just leave him there for a couple of years. There's no reason to rush him. Shane Malloy with us, Hockey Prospect Radio. Shane, I've got to ask you about the goaltending prospects, and maybe just first off, speak to the challenges of scouting goalies. Um, <laughs> you mean speak- my challenges, or just in general? Well, just in general, like. <laughs> Like the Jets picked Dom DeVincentis, who signed his three year ELC today in the seventh round. He puts up insane numbers as the OHL goaltender of the year. And I'm still trying to figure out how Thomas Millich was passed over twice and was available for the Jets in the fifth round when you look at the incredible resume he's crafted as a WHL uh, All Star. I'm not a goaltending scout. I'm totally honest about that. The best thing I can evaluate for goaltenders is their mental emotional side. If they're not in good enough shape and they start to break down, I have conversations with them. You can see it in their body language. You can see it in their uh, structure in terms of standing up tall. But other than that, the actual mechanics of it, that's why I lean on Brad Allen, my co-host, because he's a goalie scout, a couple of other guys that I knock on doors to ask because it's such a technical um, position. And I think you, I think every NHL team needs to have two or three guys who are just specifically goalie scouts, because for the rest of us, it's I might as well throw darts at a dartboard. Like I can probably get the first top three guys, but maybe even then my evaluation is incorrect, and my my upside 
is incorrect. It's so hard, Andrew. Uh, I don't even bother to even attempt to fake it because you just look like an ass, right? So I just, I refer to other people and I learn as much as I possibly can. I mean, it just seems, uh, I mean, at a certain point, these guys are judged on what they do in the net. And, you know, we were comparing the numbers between Divincentis and Milich last year. And I mean, the guy with the worst numbers was 36, nine and two, a 919 save percentage and a 233 goals against average and the best goalie in his league. Like it, it, it something just doesn't compute. Although Connor well, Hellebuck it, was a fifth rounder as well. This happens all the time, doesn't it? Well, it's environment. You know, the environment you're playing in, the system you're playing in, your system you're playing that's being played in front of you, the quality of your team in front of you. You know, Milich was lucky. He had the best team in the Western Hockey League, arguably the best team in the CHL to be honest, if they hadn't been so beat up, I think they would have won the Memorial cup. So that translates to like, sometimes the numbers are very deceiving when it comes to goaltenders. That's one of the things I learned is don't just lean on the numbers because it, uh, it will smack you hard in places. You don't want to be smacked. <laughs> so that's uh goaltenders are, are voodoo to me in that respect, but I'm, I'm working on it slowly. Well, I, I can tell you, Shane, this is a perfect time to get you on, and people have been really appreciating your visit. I guess just finally on the way out, I mean, there's a number of players we didn't mention, but when you look at the prospect cupboard that the Winnipeg Jets have built, led by Barlow and McGrory and Lambert, um, would you, I'm not necessarily even needing you to compare it to the rest of the National Hockey League, but from an organizational perspective, how bright is the future for the Winnipeg Jets when it comes to these young men that are at this camp right now? Off the top of my head, I, I it would be fair to say they're probably 10th in terms of quality and quantity, maybe higher. I mean, Chibrikov's a player. So Perfetti's already turned into a player. Chaz Lucius, Lambert, Solomonson, Gordy, like Barlow. They got some guys coming. Like it's going to be, you know, and you know, a couple other guys are beginning to get the next steps. Gustafson is starting to come through. Right. There's some guy like it really, you know, for, you got to be patient with prospects. It's really five to seven years, five to seven years before you really understand what you have. Some guys get in a little sooner. They'll get into the NHL, but doesn't mean they're thriving. In many cases, they're surviving. So patience is the key. The, the organizations who have the most patience really end up long term coming out ahead. 